bring in your cultural competency and create opportunities for you to realize your potential. Don't lose that cultural grounding because it adds value to the Western way of knowing. It's another way of, um, it's another knowledge that you're bringing into the realm of ac academics. So don't lose that cultural knowledge. Malo Lele, everybody. Uh, Ibn Fihoko here. And uh, at this time, I've got uh, an amazing guest with me, uh, Dr. Julian Nanai. Um, and I, I'm grateful and blessed to have you here. Um, I'll get you to introduce yourself um, and um, your, where you come from, family, and also education background. Yeah, Talo Falava, Mahalor Soifua Mawa, Malangi Ma. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you, Edmund Fehoko, Dr. Fehoko, uh, for this amazing uh, chance to document our stories. I'm from Samoa. I have, uh, I'm a product of the colonization world. Samoa has been colonized by the Germans. So on my maternal side, I have a little bit of German grandfather. And on my father's side, paternal side, I'm of Chinese heritage. So one of those Chinese or the boat people from Canton who were brought as indentured servants to Samoa. Both grandmothers on both sides are full, pure Samoan. So I guess that makes me Samoan, mm. Edmund. <laughs> and uh, I have uh, been educated mainly, primarily in Samoa until tertiary level. So my first scholarship was to Canterbury University. That's where I did my first bachelor degree in undergrad. And then I had another opportunity to do uh, postgrad studies masters at USP, the University of the South Pacific in Fiji. And then later on, um, another opportunity through the Monbusho Scholarship, the both uh, the two first um, degrees were funded by the New Zealand Aid, so this was the first time that I've been on a another a different scholarship through the Monbusho Japanese Scholarship to do doctorates in uh, Japan. So that's a bit of my mm. background. As a Samoan with Chinese background, um, then coming to. Uh, to Aotearoa to be educated, and then going to Japan to further your education. Um, what, did, what did it look like in regards to you pursuing education and also having a family as well at the same time? How did, how did you balance that? It's very interesting um, being a woman, uh, having children. Um, when I did my undergrad studies, um, I was not married yet. However, I guess you bring, you bring skills of hard work. You bring your family's name with you because you tend to have the motivation, the no loto, as Vaivai says, mm. that uh, you don't want to fail because if you do, the whole community, the whole village, mm. <laughs> the whole government knows. So uh, I guess that's a push, you know, to do well. And um, and because Samoa was uh, very, very needy of teachers. So after the, the degree level, I was asked to do, to go on to Christchurch College of Education to do a diploma in secondary teaching. Um, so all those, and a little bit of a personal motivation is that my parents were divorced then, and um, my father was a very successful businessman, but the divorce took toll on me. So education was my pathway to get out of the, so I was staying with my other grandparents. So going 
going to the plantation four o'clock in the morning, planting taros, uh, collecting firewoods, the the hard work in terms of physical hard work pushed me to do well in education. And I think those were some of the attributes that I brought with me. Um, everybody in Samoa thinks Chinese people work hard. So I think I have a little bit of everything uh, that I brought with me. Uh, I just uh, listened to a, a study yesterday on the radio that um, in America where uh, said 80 to 90 percent is your positive and optimistic motivation and 7 percent is your intelligence. So um, I like to think that uh, some of that <laughs> big part of it was the motivation and the push factors that I brought with me to New Zealand. You, you've mentioned motivation. And now everyone that's come to this podcast, um, which is called A Diary of an Island Scholar, um, everyone that's sat on your seat at the moment, I've asked them just one question. Um, and the question I'm going to ask you is, who is your motivation today? My father. My father passed away um, when I finished my first degree. When I took the degree to my father, he says, what's next? Um, I didn't stay with my father long because they were divorced. But every time I went to my father, I feel that I wasn't good enough. Mm. So the motivation to go further was really from him. And when I got my master's degree, he said, what's next? <laughs> um, because he never spent that long time in mm. university, he thinks that I should be the one <laughs> um, making use of all the opportunities to realize my potential. Yeah. And I, he passed away when I submitted my doctorates in September in Japan and October. It's the first time my father said to me, I'm not worried about you anymore. It's the first time that he said he loved me <laughs> for the for all this time that when when my parents were divorced. So uh, that was very emotional for mm. me. Yeah. It took a long while to get over that he's gone. Mm. Yeah. So um I owe this <laughs> mm. to him. And my father was a staunch Mormon. He always wanted me to go back to the Mormon church. And I think I'm concerned because everybody around me, even my grandchildren, they're Mormons <laughs> now. <laughs> yes, so um, the, yeah, mm. all the spiritual stuff and the yeah and the, the fatherly. Yeah, awesome. I'm going to take this a bit deeper now. Okay. You now this camera is looking directly at you. Okay. And I want you to picture your father being behind that camera. Now, if you had the opportunity to say anything to him. <laughs> And, and motivating you and pushing you to become the person that you are today, what would you say to him standing behind that camera? Well, Dad, I did what you asked me to do. I obeyed everything. Always a good girl. Went to school, came back home, always on time. I didn't deviate. Uh, but I hope uh, you have made a place for me up in heaven. Uh, this is all earthly stuff, but I hope I will see you someday mm. in eternity. Thank you. Again, if you're just tuning in, welcome to the Diary of an Island Scholar. And uh, we have Dr. Julian Nanai here who's just um, shared uh, some very emotional insights and also um, motivating um, factors to, to why she is the person that she is today. And for a lot of us PhD scholars here of Pacific descent, uh, we may sit in, like, in high power um, fields, but at the same time, we also serve our communities. And the purpose of this podcast is to ensure that what we do in our respective fields is also coming back to the community to serve them as well. And what better way to do it but to hear the stories of, of our journeys of our um, within our PhD journeys, but also just being in our communities and families. So, again, thank you. I know that that took a lot. 
Um, and again, it's a good way just to reflect on how far we've come. A lot of the time, uh, we are so busy within our fields uh, in education or in research, and there is not a time that we could actually sit back for, say, a good half an hour and reflect on how far we've come. So um, sincere apologies that the makeup has has gone, but we can fix that later, yeah. All right, now going back to your uh, your day job, uh, if you can share what you are currently doing. So it's interesting that you asked me how to balance. I have six children. Um, so after the first degree I had, um, I had the children and I did the master's after having one and a half children. After the master's, I had four children. When the master's, I had the graduation, I had the fifth one. So after the doctorate, I had the sixth one. So it's interesting how you ask me, how do I balance? I work in the equity space for the Faculty of Health and Environmental Sciences within the Auckland University of Technology. And it, it does require a lot of knowing how to balance work and family commitments as well as study and as well as all the other little bits and pieces that are challenges you every now and then, the politics of the university and uh, also the different personalities that you deal with every day. So that's what I do. And I try to ensure, first of all, I was hired to help postgrad because Pacifica postgrad didn't have good pass rates within Auckland University. And the, when I came in, um, uh, Professor Peggy Fairbairn Dunlop was one of my uh, the mentors and uh, I was able to help in um, facilitating postgraduate studies, postgraduate workshops. But, uh, but there's a big need in helping undergrads. So there, there was a model called the Pacific Learning Village model when I first started 12 years ago within the Auckland University of Technology. And that required a lot of academic and pastoral support and um, ensuring that the students access not only the services, but also to, to help the system know that the students, the Pacifica students, come in not only with baggages, but also there are issues that they need to be have a humanistic approach about it, even though they say that it is the university for the Pacifica. But there are some allocations where students, our students, have cultural rights to ensure that they are um, they are being given certain, how do you say, I'm not too sure if the excuse or the, the, the right word, but at least give time. You know, the, the way that our students learn is not the norm within their families or communities. So when we come into the way, the lecture approach, the tutorial approach, um, that may not always work for all the students, the examination approach, you know. So there, there are certain pedagogies or methodologies that needs to be tailor-made for the our Pacifica students. So that's what I do. I try to hmm, put the human face <laughs> on, the, on our uh, students' uh, way of learning, yeah. Mm. And so being... Being Samoan born, migrating to New Zealand, and, and, and now you see the, the increase of New Zealand born Samoans and also Pacific uh, students come into and enter the education system here in New Zealand. What would you see the, the big differences are uh, in regards to the New Zealand born students' experience compared to what you experienced back? Um, in Samoa, as a Samoan migrant coming to New Zealand? There's, there's not, it, it, it depends on how you see it, Edmund. As first migrants, 
there's al- there'll always be that culture of silence within the classroom. Um, I was told that some think that if we don't question the lecturers, uh, we're like uh, either fakama, uh, shy, or um, we're scared that uh, other students think that we're dumb. Yeah. But if you are a first generation of the first migrants, the values are still there. So the culture of silence still exists within those. So the equity work does advocate for our students in such a way. And I've been in those shoes. I've been in those shoes where um, geography is my major, where you want to understand an assignment. You don't know how to ask. (laughs) And uh, you don't know whether you should go and ask or not. Um, But uh, sometimes the peers that you hang out, good peers, I mean, not the ones that take you drinking. Uh, Sometimes the peers, you talk to peers and sometimes they are the voice for for you, advocate. And then it's then you learn because um I I may I may look like I have good uh competency in English, but having learning Japanese, Samoan and English, you have to take time to process information from Samoan to English. Sometimes it's literal and it doesn't make sense in the English sense. So uh, that culture of silence still exists even now in our universities from our, whether it's first or second generation. The third or the second generation are more vocal. Yeah. But then there are various uh, families who encourage their uh, children to speak out. And those are the ones that that do well, they challenge the lecturers. In fact, some of our uh, Tongan postgrads didn't know that being critical is actually a way of um, challenging the theories. So when you teach them even simple things like, do you gossip? (laughs) And they laugh at you. I said, no, writing a literature review is like uh, saying, who said that? Who said that? Then you question And you think whether you should spread the word because you need to know whether the source is reliable, whether the source is up to date. uh, And why would we use Vygotsky to challenge the upbringing of a Tongan student? Why do we use Ericsson to challenge the Samoan? So this is how I'm able to provide that lens to our our Pacific uh, students who come in. Because like them, I'm like them, we were all trained as the Western knowledge. And that has always been the universal truth. And we take it literally, like, you know, religiously. And we think that's the right way always. And when we go back to work in Samoa, we always think that this is the right way. But no, yeah, we have the fasinomanga. We have the va relational space that we still need to be, to maintain and, in, and be intact. So... In that way, our students don't have to leave, you know, leave their culture at the at the gates of AUT. But uh, once they got that concept, I was so proud that some of those students, including yourself, <laughs> uh, are able to challenge the academic integrity rather than thinking that you're fia poco. Yeah. So I guess, uh, yeah, I guess that's 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 what I bring mm. to the. To, to our students. It's, it's uh, very um, heartening to hear and how you, in the work that you're currently doing, you're bringing in everyday experiences that our Pacific people do on a daily mm-hmm. to, to a Western uh, institution that, that teaches and educates uh, Pacific researchers on how to do research but on a Western way. Mm-hmm. And, and so on that point, what would you encourage? What would you say to our up and coming postgrads uh, of Pacific descent, to in regards to the point that you've mentioned, mm. uh, uh, the importance of looking at our traditional ways, uh, the mm. importance of looking at our 
the ways that we did it for years that mm. at times were largely ignored by yes. in the research field. But now the work that you're doing, you're revitalizing such such cultural practices. What would you encourage our postgrads to do now? Bring in your cultural competency and create opportunities for you to realize your potential. Don't lose that cultural grounding because it adds value to the Western way of knowing. It's another way of, uh, it's another knowledge that you're bringing into the realm of ac academics. So don't lose that cultural knowledge. Bring the skills, your beliefs and practices and uh, blend it in. And sometimes for me, I get educated by our postgrad students. It's like a two-way process. I learn more because they are the expertise of their not of that field that they bring, and we just facilitate the academic way. But don't lose your tonginess, don't lose your samoness, your newness, because they uh, make a difference in the academic world. Yeah. Mm. Awesome. Your PhD your PhD research. Can you shed some light into that and what you explored? Okay. My PhD is on sustainable development. I've always been intrigued with the notion, uh, how do you marry economic development and uh, sustainable development? Because to achieve sustainable development, you always have to lose something, whether it's the environment or uh, some cultural knowledge, uh, and there's always something that will, to, re, to re, replace uh, something, something has to go. And that's why I was intrigued about this concept. When I did my PhD in the 1990s, it was such a fashionable term at that time, sustainable development. But it didn't have a measure. I mean, economic development was so advanced. It had the GDP and it knew what activities could be measured. Even the poverty line is measured in economic terms. So I thought I should embark on this journey to find out what uh, sustainable development is uh, through the conservation-based activities. So I did a study because the, the scholarship was a Japanese scholarship. There was only a small part of uh, Japan in the south, called, uh, in Okinawa Islands, another because it's made of so many islands, but I, it was called Idiomote Island. And it had the whole, um, I was thinking, how could you conserve the resources when people like Samoa, you need it daily. I mean, your food, your sustenance in terms of firewood for the breakfast, lunch, and dinner is all from the backyard, Yeah. So this is where I went, and then I compared it to a, a place in Samoa where they also had a mangrove conservation area. Well, what happened is that you need to listen to the local people, and you whatever projects that the government, like the, the SPRIP, the South Pacific, they always need to work in line with the local people because they are the one impacted. It's their livelihood. You can't ask uh, a person to grow to go and grow ginger farming in inland when you can't even sustain the fish that they get every day and you know most of the crabs they catch the crab because it's a has a higher value and they sell it they don't need and uh, i had a like a i, I had a, a question which was just to um to put them off guard oh yeah we fish we fish and um we always fish and eat and get the crabs. So you so you ask them a dummy question like, so what did you have last night? Oh, we had mutton flaps. So um, so you see how the products are because of commercialization and because even in the villages, you have to pay the school fees, you have to pay the electricity power. What do you need? Money. So a lot of the resources are overfished because they want, need the monies. And um, you, even the bar of soap you have in the sugar, you need to buy it from the store. So 
sustainable development for who, you know? And and it's it's something that I'm I'm still, you know, investigating. Mm-hmm. So I there was a follow up um, research that uh, we did a few years ago with some of the other colleagues, and um, I think we need to go back to the definition of the local people, what they think is sustainable development and what they want mm. is sustainable development. Yeah. Exciting. And, and just like research in general, right? A lot of the work that we're doing, we we have to go back to the local people because we talk very high-level language here, particularly in education, but that's not transferred and translated accordingly to un- make our local people and communities understand right, what we're actually talking about. Mm. And so going back... Say, if you had the opportunity, now we've seen a rise, uh, an increase of Pacific research methods and methodologies, something that, unfortunately, you didn't have back in your time. And, but, you know, if you had the opportunity, which method would you use today that you would see would support and maybe even strengthen your research Mm -hmm. that you did back then? Well, you see, Edmund, the good thing about... um, Growing up in Samoa, you you actually know um, how to go back to the village. So the Fafalitui method is the one that I've used. But the Fafalitui implies that you have to uh, Fafalitui with the seat of the chiefs, the Matai, because in the village they have their own fales, the fale of the house or, or the wives of the chiefs, and then the fale of the the ladies uh, of the village and then the fali of the untitled men, yeah. But the way that I did the farfatui was I mixed them up, yeah, because I, I think that there's, the important thing is that you got to know the protocols and because I spoke the language. And in Samoa, um, even though there are many districts and village, historically pre-missionary, there are always orators of the different regions that I did capitalize on. So I got that orator to be the main person, the mediator between the different um, groups. Uh, so that's the method. And But I want to say, even though we, um, we use participant observation in my time, when I did the doctorates, I took three trips to Idiomote Island to familiarize myself. But I didn't know there was a different dialect. So I ended up speaking the dialect. I forgot it now, but I had to speak the dialect. It, they speak the general Japanese, but they had their own dialect. And I'm, because I'm a very cheerful person, uh, I use the method of, you know, sharing stories. Uh, they're very much collective, just like the Samoan people. They t- didn't even know that I was from Samoa. They thought I had, because Taiwan and Iriomote Island are not far from each other. They thought I was from Taiwan. <laughs> but, um, and they even had a primary school song that um, touched on Samoa, which, you know, so it was like there was some common ground. So the same thing with Samoa, because when I went back, they already knew me as somebody who was working in the education system. Yeah. So uh, some of these were already, not, but you know, in, in now islands, a lot of our people, they share a lot of responsibilities. They're not only Matais, but they might be a CEO in the government sector, but they also might be a uh, youth leader in the church. So the, 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 the various titles that they hold was so enriching. Yeah. So the Fafaletui, um, it's supposed to be in publication now, but mm. uh, we'll get we'll get there. But the important thing is that, the, I, like I did with the Japanese people, because I had to learn Japanese and I had to write in Japanese. I didn't translate the scripts. I mean, I translate um, the publication afterwards, but I translate the I I uh, you extract the things from the Samoan context from the Samoan words. So those are terminologies and the cultural nuances that I want to bring forward hmm. yeah, to the research. If you're tuning in to the Stella Noa at the moment, uh, welcome to the Diary of an Island Scholar. We've got Dr. Julian and I just sharing some insights of a PhD study looking at sustainable development um, and a 
comparison between Samoa and Japan um, as well. So you mentioned earlier uh, the the term cultural competency, and, and pretty much that's pretty much it, right? You, for a lot of the researchers coming in uh, into university and wanting to do research within our Pacific communities, nine times out of ten, it's not actually the content, but it's the relationship that matters with our people. And so based on what you've just said, you know, we, we now see a, a truckload of Pacific students entering research spaces. Mm-hmm. What would you say to them uh, on how to better engage themselves with our communities? Um, cultural competency involves a lot of things. Yeah. It's not only knowing the protocols, the language, the relational space. But I want to quote Judge Taumanu, a Maori uh, judge. He says, it's very much like tikanga. you got to know uh, when to do the right thing and how to do it at the right time. And to do that, you have to spend some time with the community. you got to live with the community. you got to eat with the community. you got to be with the community. And you got to engage with activities within the community to develop that rapport. Well, you know, in English we say rapport, but it's really like the, the va, yeah. And um, before you actually go in, because I want to quote one of my aunties who've been a subject of a lot of like uh, Melania Nye's um, studies. She says, you got to know the pathway. When you bring in a, a, a researcher, she says, why would I share you the knowledge? Why would I answer you? Who are you? She questions the identity of that person. But when I brought the student with me, she says, that's the right way to do it. you got to know the awala, your pathway to come here, because we don't just give the knowledge and the response to anyone. we got to know who we're giving, sharing the knowledge to. Not everybody is privy to that knowledge. Yeah. So mm. I guess that's Yeah, no, absolutely. And and that's critical information for for those who are wanting to do research and engage with Pacific communities, not just to get a degree, but in you know, in what you've just mentioned, it's important to immerse yourself into our cultures mm-hmm. and communities to really get a, a grasp of our everyday life and not just go out and create and write up something that really doesn't highlight what we actually do on a daily basis so that's um yeah no that's very heartening and, and i and i thank you for for that as well um some of the struggles that you've seen as and uh, the work that you do but also as pacific scholars in in such you know in the university spaces that we work in what are some of the struggles that you've experienced and also that you have observed as well i want to finish off first mm. with the um not only being with the community, but also that the, whatever research you do is not only liberating, but always it has a some positive outcome and then you take it back. And that's the challenge as academics because we are measured by like PBRFs, quality outputs, academic outputs, and we strive to tick this box. <laughs> yes, and... Um, but I, I've been very fortunate because the, like in Japan, they're used to surveys because that's how the government collects information, even for elderly. I mean, in every village, there is a community hall for elderly. Everything uh, that they grow is all what the people, the government listen to the people and the people participate in maybe like a fafaritui. When they call meetings, they come and they voice. Um, so uh, the challenge for me is trying to not only put the knowledge out there for academic purposes so that we make we create that space for ourselves in the academic world, but we also have to be mindful that this research has to go back to also our people. Yes, but how do you take it back? I've been very fortunate because some of them – uh, already in the government departments and educational, I was asked to present back at the National University of Samoa Conference. So in a way, I took it back. But it has a lot of policy implications that I still want to make um, 
to make a contribution. But the other thing is that um, because we're always asked to write in English, our whatever field or research that we do, we have to be mindful that we also should also have the translation, the Samoan text, if I'm going to take this back. And that's the long-term plan now for me, <laughs> is not only to produce whatever book that I want to use as a, a, a text for education back home or geography or university, but I want the Samoan version as well because a lot of them who shared were also um, – like the gurus of the language, you know, the, who published the Samoan texts of, of, of the nuances of the different uh, proverbs, the Mwangangana, yeah, which has historical, legendary um, uh, traces that you don't find anywhere else. And, and I want to yeah, maintain. And the other thing is a lot of the people that I do research with even like our students, I make them as the main authors. So I've done that for some of our students and some of the participants have agreed to be co-authors. Yeah, so uh, at least, you know, you we say in Samoa, you throw your stone, you have made a contribution not only to um, acknowledging it's their cultural property, intellectual property, not only globally, because it will be a published, but also it will go back to the community. And, and you know, they are actually very credible sources for our community, mm. for the next generation. Amazing. Uh, and I totally acknowledge um, the, the work that you're doing and, and being transparent with, it and mm. with our communities and allowing them to be a part of not just the, public, the publication, the dissemination, as we all, always do as researchers, but in the code design, right up to the implementation of the research is, you know, right to the end. So that's that's an encouragement for those who are tuning in and doing work with our Pacific people. Allow them to be a part of the code design, but also get them to be a part of the dissemination, mm -hmm. both in the local space, but also at the uh, academic space as well. And give them that voice. They usually become voiceless uh, in our communities that we serve. So, you know, going back to the work that you're doing at AUT, working alongside a number of Pacific scholars. What, what have you seen uh, some of the challenges and also some of the opportunities that we get as Pacific scholars at universities? See, I, the challenges, um, I, I feel for our adult students sometimes because they have left their jobs wanting to make, um, create um, be role models for their children, but also to upskill themselves for the betterment of their families. And then we have scholarships. I won't say the scholarships, <laughs> but some of them are only given to um, children or students who just came from secondary schools. Whereas, you know, some of our adult students were educated in the islands or... Um, maybe have just gone to make one training course and they are being marginalized for these opportunities. So those are some of the challenges that I face with our postgrad students who want to go further. But also um, having more Pacific academics as supervisors. There's, I mean, when you have uh, equity like portfolio holders uh, who may not walk the talk, so to speak, just window dressing, like some of our uh, graduates in PhD who have applied for some of our courses, where's the box that they tick that they have um, not only satisfied diversity and equity, they end up, you know, just because they're the, nepo, the nepotism approach because they know this other person and yet we are trying to, to minimize the, um, the, 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 the inequitable um, representation of our Pacific 
uh, people in the academics. So those are some of the challenges, but also the resources. Um, the Tertiary Education uh, Commission provides funding to our universities to help our Māori and Pacific. If these funding are not directed appropriately, you're one of the lucky ones, uh, Edmund, because when I had the funding, I was able to expose you to the like international conferences. Like some of the students in their last year as undergrads, we were able to take them to conference and then voila, they became postgrads straight after. Yeah. So if the resources are being taken from you again, uh, from our equity space for the Maori and Pacifica, then, then it becomes just a paying lip service to our whatever mojo or strategic objective of creating a space for the Maori and Pacifica mm. communities. Mm. So, so those are the, like the three, four things mm. that I want to highlight. Now, I, I do want to bring this almost to a close, but kind of tie it up to the next generation. And some of the challenges that you've raised, uh, what would you say now to universities to ensure that your children's generation to come to enter university spaces, my daughter's generation to come to enter the university space? What would you say to universities now to provide a better foundation for the next specific generation to come? Oh, I don't want to turn this into a political <laughs> conversation, Edmund. But I guess, like you say, we need to make a voice. <laughs> and the, those who are unseen, which is our future generation. I want to say that, um, like I said before, don't pay lip service to our Pacifica communities. Um, walk the talk. And if we go back to the the charters of the human rights and the cultural rights of indigenous people, we should be adhering to the Teteriti or Waitangi to make that partnership work. It's not just a blueprint or flagging it out there. Because if we use that as a blueprint, I think we have um, we have privileges and entitlements that our next generation should be entitled to and should be given rather than redirected. And that's that's what I mm. yeah, goes back to the people up up there. Awesome. <laughs> Any last comments to our Pacific PhDs? who are in the brink of finishing, what message would you give them now? If you have found your niche, um, let's go back and make a difference in the communities, not just publish your, your research and put it on the shelf. Um, let's all together create that space for the next generation uh, to flourish, create those opportunities for that we can realize our potential so that, uh, like you say, well, we're not framed as criminals, but we also have, you know, our own, our own niche to develop and make a difference in our own uh, societies and communities, add value to what you have found out so that uh, the relational space are still maintained and upheld, not only within um, your own families, but the communities, but also in the government sectors and uh, wherever wherever our children may end up in. <laughs> yeah. uh, there you have it, our Talanoa for today, the diary of Dr. Julian and I. Again, thank you for taking the time. I'm out of your busy schedule to join us today. Um, more information, and once the article comes out, uh, the Fafari Toy, I will then link it to this podcast and, and also her, her research as well, so you can have a read of some of the work and interesting work that she's doing for our community. So, uh, tune in to our next Alanoa. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Kia ora.